Hello, Petal. Well, I enjoyed the Biggie chat because it appears there is a great love of biscuits out there and the chocolate hobnobs has come out as the clear winner with three votes. Yes, seems like everybody likes chocolate hobnobs. But then again, there were some honourable mentions out there. So as far as it goes, whatever Biggie's people have chosen, by all means, give them a try or the equivalent. Today, I have been working on making a dough for Nice biscuits. It's very easy, actually. It's just like whizzing up some coconut flakes and dump them in the basic picky mix. Uh, I don't get out much. I digress. <laughs> oh, I'm only joking. It's just a bit of fun. So, thank you very much for joining me for Chapter 3, May Contain Traces of Magic, J.W. Wells and Co. Book 6 of 8. Hmm. How did we get this far along? For anybody that doesn't know, we do have a playlist, a podcast playlist on um, on this channel. And it's Increed's Tom Holt. And they should all be in order on there. Now, if I've accidentally like tagged something to watch later and it's in there, just ignore it or enjoy it. Whichever way you want to go. <laughs> so, as usual, if you could hit the like button if you're liking it and do the bing bong like notification bell if you want to get notified of when new episodes come out, please do and share and subscribe if you really like it. But let's crack on, shall we? Chapter 3. It's not really our sort of thing, the manager said after a long silence. No, sorry. I don't see our customers going for that, she added, as the tiny genie hovered a few inches above the spout of its lamp, its minuscule fingers dabbing at the keypad of its mobile phone. I mean, he doesn't really do anything, does it? Very true, Chris thought. You get three wishes, he said cheerfully. The manager shook her head. Not much good for anything. Though, are they? Can't do this. Not allowed to do that. Terms and conditions apply, he conceded reluctantly. But it's very attractively priced, and you can add the upgrade packs, which give you extra wishes, so... No, she said firmly. No, we already do the imagination range from Zalberwerk. They're much better... You get six wishes as standard, and they can actually do stuff. All yours does is sit there on its little cloud saying, that option is not available with this product. Sorry, but I'll pass on that one. Thanks all the same. What else have you got? Ah, Chris said. Now, I know you're going to love this. He opened the sample case and took out the book... The Book of All Human Knowledge, New Edition. Always been a strong seller, and now all new with additional... No, she cut him off. Sorry, we had two dozen of them last year, and when the customers got them home and opened them, all the pages were blank. Very embarrassing for us, having to explain. She had a point there. Even with the all-new operating system, which he told her about, but she clearly wasn't impressed. The book was severely limited by the fact that it only told you what you really needed to know, not what you wanted or what you thought you needed. If you try to override the system by, for example, thinking, this isn't what I wanted to find out about, why hasn't the stupid thing got an index? The book tended to freeze its pages blank apart from a tiny little black hourglass constantly revolving on the copyright page just below the Isbun number. Chris moved on. Insta glamour cream, he said, holding up a small glass jar. Apply sparingly last thing at night and in the morning you're irresistibly beautiful. No quibble guarantee. Lasts up to nine hours. Very sensibly priced at... We stock the super glamour me from... Michigan magical, she said wearily, lasts longer and doesn't fade in direct sunlight. I'm surprised you're still bothering with that stuff. 
He explained that the Insta Glamour came in four handy sizes, whereas Super Glamour Me only came in three, and it was the glamour cream of choice of international supermodels such as Ariana Vetterelli and who? Uh, she's not so well known over here, Chris admitted. Very big in Monaco, though, and she won't use anything else. We provide a range of promotional... No... And the same goes for the silver tongue syrup, she added. Doesn't work. After all, she went on, a trifle unnecessarily in his opinion. If it worked, you'd be using it and I'd be buying your stuff. There's an ethical code, he replied weakly. We're not allowed. Is that it then? she said, giving him that never really expected anything from you look that he'd grown so tired of over the years. Only I've got the Kawagachia rep coming in at 12.30. I'm taking him to lunch. Chris managed to smile, somehow or other. That's about it for this month, he said. Apart, of course, from our very latest new line, which I've been saving till last because I just know it's going to blow your socks off. The JWW BB27K. Oh, that, she grinned. Heard all about it from Susie at the Telford branch. She had a customer. She brought one and parked her car in it. Came back half an hour later and the car had gone. Vanished. Called out the AA. Finally got the supernatural breakdown service. The bloke told her it had fallen through the fabric of space-time into a pocket reality and it had cost 900 quid plus VAT to get it out again. And it was only a cruddy old fiesta, so it wasn't worth it. Nah, you can keep them. I'm not having them in my shop. There was, of course, a perfectly rational explanation in that case, and if the customer had read the instructions properly and checked for layer lines like the booklet said, it wouldn't have happened. But he didn't bother telling her. Waste of breath. Well, Chris said, if you change your mind, you've got my number, so should we just run through the repeat orders? She nodded. Just the DW6, she said. I think we'll up that from nine dozen to twelve just in case we get a sudden run. Your delivery people are so slow. Just for a moment, he was tempted to ask, but he didn't. Right-ho, he said, twelve dozen dried waters. What else can I... That's all, she said. See you next month, then. It could have been worse, he told himself, as he walked back to the car. Could have had that bloody trainee with me. Small mercies. Angela the trainee had called in sick, or at least her mother, who happened to be a personal friend of Mr Burnott's, would have been nice if Angela thought to mention that, had rung him at home to say her daughter had come back a nervous wreck, and what was that stupid Chris person thinking of, taking her to where there could be demons. It was just a wonder she hadn't been killed or horribly mutilated, and she was really upset about it. Sometimes small mercies are very small indeed, and come with a side salad of aggravation. But at least, without her there, he could use the sat-nav. Chris stopped dead, his hand on the door handle. Why would he want to use the sat-nav when he could find his way from kettles to black country esoterica blindfold on a dark night in the fog? He let go of the handle, as though there might be something infectious on it, and took a step back, nearly treading on the foot of a passing stranger. There was that problem... He'd been warned about it at the sales conference when they'd launched the product. The JWW Queenie, quasi-intelligent navigational instrument, Queenie, for which some genius in marketing had been paid good money, was a state-of-the-art, a million percent more accurate and reliable than the Stone Age, non-magic version, that ran on some kind of radio signal beamed off an American military satellite. But there was a problem nor bother if a few simple precautions were observed, and they'd tweaked the bugs enough to get it to comply with the latest EU regs. But, actually, Chris thought it was more than a little problem, and when they told him he could have one, he hadn't been keen. I know way around my own patch, thank you very much, he told them. I certainly don't need a bloody condemned soul imprisoned in a little plastic 
box with a set of OS maps to tell me how to get from Wolverhampton to Stafford without going through Birmingham city centre. It's fine, they told him. The wards and containment spells are absolutely watertight and foolproof. There's absolutely no way the bug is getting out of there. You've just got to be a tiny bit careful, that's all. Asked to define careful in this context, however, they'd gone ever so slightly vague. Treat it with respect. Don't play with it. Use a bit of common sense. And other well-meaning but useless advice. Chris had driven for a month like a lorry driver hauling nitroglycerin until Ben Jarrow, who had the southeastern patch, finally told him what all the fuss was about. Yes, the unit was powered by a living entity, usually a sprite, dryad, water nymph or salamander. Invariably, one that had committed some crime against the laws of its community and had been given a life sentence. But that was fine, since the wards really did work. Otherwise, the Standards Commission would never have signed off on it. The only danger lay in getting, well, Ben had said, looking a little strange, in getting attached to it. What? Caught up in the worrying or something? No, Ben had said patiently, getting fond of it talking to it, maybe starting to believe it was talking back, having a conversation. But the risk wasn't worth worrying about, he'd continued, because who in his right mind would start talking to a navigational aid? Only someone who was a bit not quite right in the head, or a really sad bugger. And in any case, he'd added, if you do start to feel like you're getting caught, all you've got to do is turn the radio on, or play a CD, and the spell's broken. Simple as that. You'll never think it'll be you. Yours reckon you're too smart, and then it's too late. You're hooked, caught, in the shit, and everybody's giving you sad, sympathetic looks that really mean, told you so, so easily done. But Chris told himself, as he nerved himself to touch the car door again, It's all right. I caught it in time. I'll be sensible from now on, and it'll all be fine. So he climbed in and sat perfectly still for a moment or so. Then he leaned across and reached for the radio. For a split second, his fingers brushed the sat-nav's little rectangular screen, and he felt a sudden urge to press the button. Bad, he thought, very bad, and stretched past it until he felt the radio knob click into place. Safe. <laughs> there, see? Nothing to it, really. The radio. A Jeremy Vine, sure. The daily current affairs fawn in spot. It put up with it for ten minutes, then turned it off, reflecting that if the spirit of the satnav really was a nasty piece of work suffering eternal damnation for its sins, the only real difference between satnav and the radio was that Jeremy was getting peered. After that, he drove in silence for a bit. Then, more through absent-mindedness than anything else, he turned on the CD player. That tune again. It really was rather catchy, though Chris couldn't remember a note of it after it had finished, a point in its favour, since there's nothing worse than having a song rattling around in your head all day. Distracting, though, which meant the diversion on the outskirts of Walsall took him completely by surprise, and before he could react, he'd been swept away by the currents of the traffic and was heading at considerable speed in the wrong direction. Sod it! Chris thought, because the countryside he was being swirled along through was some way off his customary route, and he didn't know offhand how you got back onto the main dual carriageway, which in any event was close for resurfacing. Just as well, he told himself, that I've got my little friend here. He pressed the button, frowned. Something at the back of his mind. No, gone, and waited for... Hello, Chris, she said. Hi, look, I'm trying to get to Walsall, she said. But you missed the diversion. Not to worry, your route is being calculated. Please wait. So he waited, and while she was thinking about it, he said, You missed a bit of excitement yesterday. Poor Mr. Newsome. It must have been terrible finding him like that. Well, it wasn't much fun. Chris replied, standing there with that thing sat there looking at me. I think you were very brave, she said. Most people would have panicked. 
It wasn't like that, actually, he replied. It's a funny thing, but when something like that happens, I don't know, maybe it's the survival instinct suddenly cutting in and taking charge, but I knew exactly what I had to do. Keep still and quiet, no sudden movements, get out of there nice and slowly, and don't break eye contact. Mind you, he added, it helped a lot that it had already had its dinner, and got the impression it simply couldn't be bothered with me. It's true, she said. They don't tend to attack unless they're hungry or something upsets or annoys them. Most of them, anyway. There are some who kill for the sheer pleasure of it. Ah, well, Chris said, suddenly anxious to change the subject. You've figured out where we are yet? At the next roundabout, take the third exit. Pause, then... Your apprentice isn't with you today. Apprentice, he thought, as in the sorcerers. Nice thought. No, I think she was suffering from a bit of the old delayed shock, he said. Handled it pretty well at the time, I thought, but I guess it must have got to her later, after she got home. He overtook a slow tractor, then said, What do you make of her then? Quiet, she said, reserved, a little shy. Perhaps not very keen to be here, and young, of course. Chris nodded. Stroppy, he said. Loads of attitude. Apparently her mum's an old friend of Dave Bernos's, which explains how I got stuck with her. Rather an honour, don't you think, she said, to choose you to look after his protégé rather than one of the others. Nah, he said, though secretly he was rather taken with the idea It's just that I'm the rep for this area, and she lives locally. Also, it's a rotten job, so naturally it comes my way. You're too hard on yourself, she said soothingly. I think Mr. Bernard's chose you because you're a good salesman. And because she lives on my patch. That too. Chris drove on for a while. She'd got him back on course, on schedule too, so there was no need to rush. It was turning out fine. So he wound the window down a little and savoured the feel of the warm air on his face. Next stop was the magic shack. You never knew what sort of business you'd do there. Could be a substantial order. Could be nothing. He made a resolution to be positive. He was going to sell them lots and lots of stuff, including, at this point it was necessary to suspend reasonable disbelief, at least four dozen BB-27 keys. He had a good feeling about it. In the event, entirely justified. Five dozen BB-27 keys with special promotional material, also two dozen bottomless purses, a gross of Instaglamour cream, two pocket universes and his entire car stock of anti-demon talismans. In fact, the only line he wasn't able to interest them in was DW6. We've been meaning to ask you, said the eager, bespectacled young assistant manager. This is probably a very silly question, but what's it actually for? Saw nor sale there. The only slight flaw in an otherwise extremely pleasant call was a return. One NK77B, rejected by a customer as not fit for purpose. But how did she know it's not working? Chris asked. The assistant manager looked at him. She tried it. It didn't work. It's quite simple, really. Normally, he wouldn't have bothered arguing the toss, but today he decided to give it a go, just for the hell of it. But it's such a subjective thing, isn't it? He said, smiling insidiously. I mean, a mirror of desire shows you what you really want. What did she actually see in it? The assistant manager grinned. She saw herself looking into a mirror of desire that worked properly, he replied. Oh. Saw Chris had taken it back, all neatly packed away in its carton, and thrown it on the back seat along with all the other junk that had come to rest there over the years. Annoying, but not his fault. He started the engine and drove away. He hadn't gone far when he hit the diversion again, but not to worry, he leant across and pressed Satnav's on switch. Nothing happened. He swore, jerking the wheel, and the car swerved alarmingly. He pulled himself together, straightened up, made himself concentrate on the road. 
Chill, Chris told himself. It's just something broken, that's all. But that didn't work, because it wasn't an it. It was a she, a living creature shut up in a plastic box. Warm oh dear, maybe the poor thing was suffocating in there. Anxiously, he scanned the road ahead and was enormously relieved to see a lay-by, not far off. He pulled in, switched off the engine, unbuckled his seatbelt and leaned forward. And in doing so, happened to glance in his rearview mirror. He froze. In the mirror, grinning at him, was a demon. Being incapable of movement and therefore having nothing better to do with his time, Chris looked at it. Its skin was grey, the colour of builder's mortar, more like elephant hide than anything you'd expect to find on a human. Its body was about the size of a ten-year-old child's, but its head was bigger than its own, hairless, with round lidless eyes that were perfectly black. The teeth in its thin, very wide mouth were all about an inch long, thin, slightly curved, ending in needle points. It had a tiny snout rather than a nose, and its ears were pointed, just like Mr Spock's. It was bony, but with well-defined muscles, its elbows grotesquely pointed, its hands broad and inhumanly flat, with long, slim, five-jointed fingers tipped with claws, like a cat's, and it was grinning, well, of course it was, with those teeth, if it closed its mouth, it'd do itself an injury. Well, Chris thought, here we go, just like poor Mr Newsome. He wondered if it would hurt, if there was an afterlife, and if so, was there a nice place and a very bad place, and was the nice place as he'd always imagined it, a bit like the hotel in Malvern's where they had the annual sales conference. He didn't waste time speculating about the very bad place, because as far as he was concerned, he'd been there already, leaving at age 17 with 60 CSEs. Hello, he whispered. The demon made a very soft hissing noise, like a gas fire before you light it, and slowly extended its right arm. Chris closed its eyes, kept them screwed tight shut, until he felt something brush against his cheek and smelt that smell again. He yelped and squirmed up against the car door, his eyes opening by reflex, and he saw the demon's arm reaching carefully over his shoulder and touching the sat power button with the point of its index claw. Your route is being calculated, please, oh. For a split second, Chris felt an urge to grab the demon's wrist and pull it away, keep its filthy claws off her. But he didn't, and the demon withdrew its arm, winked at him, kicked open the near side back door and scampered out. Twice in two days, the government man said. They must like you. Not, Chris felt, a tactful thing to see, and if that was an example of his taxes at work, he had a good mind to vote for the other lot next time round. No suitably pithy comeback occurred to him, so he gave the government man a nasty look instead. In the distance, from where he was sitting on the verge, he watched the men in Dago yellow jackets coning off the road, while sniffer dogs of a breed he'd never seen before, and hoped never to see again, were snuffling up and down the tarmac. Look, he said feebly, I've told you everything I can remember. Can I go now, only... No chance, the man replied scornfully. Forensics gonna want to pull this car apart down to the subatomic level. So unless you fancy a long walk, you aren't going anywhere. Oh, Chris said. I was hoping to scrounge a lift. Now he'd offended the government man. Sorry, but we've all got a job to do here. We're not a taxi service. Now we'll be needing your clothes. What? You must be for analysis. The government man explained briskly, DNA traces, maybe flakes of skin or traces of spit, if we're really lucky. Don't know if they'll want to shave all your hair off, it depends on what we find on the clothes and the car, but don't go touching it unless you absolutely have to, or you could disturb the evidence. The government man went away, and Chris sat perfectly still for a quarter of an hour, as if his patch of grass 
was the only safe place left in the whole world. Then a familiar voice said his name, and he looked up. I got here as quickly as I could, Jill said, sitting down beside him and opening her carrier bag. She wasn't wearing dig or yellow like the others, a plain dark m s business suit and white blouse, very grown up, he couldn't help thinking. Here, have a mini Swiss roll. You must be starving. Chris took one from her, but made a real mess of taking off the foil wrapping. She took it back and did it for him. Are they really going to shave my hair off? he asked. She grinned. Bless them, she said. They're so thorough. It's all right. I'll have a word with them. And my clothes. Only this is my good suit, and I'll make sure they don't shred it, Jill said. So, she went on, now you know what I do at work. <laughs> Fun, isn't it? Chris shuddered. And you actually, well, kill them. She nodded. Actually, it's not so bad once you get used to it. It's a bit like picking up your dog's mess in a plastic bag. You try not to think about what you're actually doing, and then it's no big deal. I've never had a dog. She smiled. I know, she said, probably for that very reason. Have another Swiss roll. Keep your blood sugar up. Pause. Then, do you think you'll be able to find it? Chris asked with his mouth full. Jill shrugged. Depends on the dogs, mostly. Trouble is, they can be pretty cunning about masking their scent. We've got helicopters out with ultra-blue thermatological sensors, but they only really work at night. Daylight blurs the image too much. The foot patrols might get lucky, I suppose. But I'm not holding my breath, so... She went on. Tell me what happened. So he told her. The truth, all and nothing but, right up to the moment where the demon had reached past him with its arm. For some reason, he left that bit out. And then it winked at me, kicked the door open and scarpered, he concluded. And that's all, really. It doesn't sound much when you're telling someone else. On the contrary, Jill replied seriously. You've given me at least half a dozen good strong leads, which will be very helpful. For example... The pointed ears. That's a dead giveaway. Is it? Oh, yes. Profound nod. Means it's acquaintance. That's Latin for someone who looks for things. A searcher. Reconnaissance and special forces, essentially. If it had been basic rank and file infantry, it had rounded ears with long, pendulous lobes, while the engineer and technical grades have ears that stick out sideways. And the serpers haven't got ears at all. The five finger joints mean it was probably a mature specimen. The juveniles don't grow the fifth joint until they're at least 700 years old. Actually, you're privileged. If you care to look at it that way, the Quarren's grade is pretty rare. Some of the guys in the department have been in the business 30 years and never seen one. Bloody hell, Jill, Chris growled. You make it sound like bird watching. She laughed. <laughs> Some of them are a bit like that. She sort of whispered back, they've got copies of the Observer Book of British Demons that they carry with them wherever they go, and whenever they come across a grade or a subspecies they haven't seen before, they tick them off the list and boast about it for days in the canteen. All about sad, really, but I guess it's their way of keeping motivated. At least they don't have the dead ones stuffed and mounted any more, like they used to when I joined the department. She was being deliberately chatty, long practice at putting witnesses at their ease. Somehow Chris didn't like that. He was supposed to be her friend, damn it, not a witness. But then he'd always reckoned that with Jill, work came first, and at least she wasn't threatening to shave off all his hair. He licked melted chocolate off his fingers. What's got me puzzled, she said, is the way it just left. Without killing me first, you mean? Jill frowned, as though it said something in bad taste. Well, bluntly, yes, she said. The thing about demons is, they never waste energy. What? They insulate their lofts and stuff? She recognised that as flippancy and ignored it. 
Demons have the most amazing metabolisms, she went on. Absolutely incredible rate of cellular regeneration, which is why you can cut off a hand or a foot and 20 minutes later, it'll have grown back. Goodness knew. If only we could crack the science behind it, we could do the most amazing things with human medicine. But for some reason, the demons aren't terribly keen on cooperating with our researchers. Bleak grin. Anyway... It's good from their point of view. Makes them practically impossible to kill without magic. But it means they use up a hell of a lot of energy. So they eat masses, but that's awkward for them considering what they eat. They can't go around slaughtering people every time they get a fit of the nibbles, or they'd pose a real threat to human society, and it'd turn into open war. They've got more sense. They know that if they keep their attacks dying to a minimum, we'll keep covering it up to stop the public at large finding out that they exist. Can't have that, obviously. There'll be mass hysteria. So, she went on, after a pause for breath, they've learned to conserve their energy. Like you've seen lions at the zoo, right? All they do is lie around sleeping all day, because when they hunt, assuming they're not in zoos, I mean, when they're in the wild... They burn off about a million calories a second, so when they're not hunting, they just flop. Same with demons, only more so, of course. I mean, just the effort of projecting themselves out of their native dimension and into the material world is enough to drain their batteries, which is why you only see them when they're actively on the warpath, so to speak. Which is why, she went on, I can't really figure out why your one went to all the trouble of materialising in your car and then just smiled nicely at you and buggered off. I see, Chris replied. He was starting to shake now. Delayed reaction, presumably. Lucky for you, of course, Jill added. But a mystery. Now, the one you saw yesterday, that was classic post-attack lethargy. It had worn itself out, killing the shop person. It simply couldn't be bothered with you. That's when they're at their most vulnerable, actually, just after feeding. Their batteries are flat after the kill, and until they've digested some food, they digest really quickly, but it still takes time. They're basically too weak to move, and their defences are low, too, which makes killing them that much easier. A thought struck her, and she looked sideways at him, not one of her usual repertoire of looks. The one yesterday, she said. Pointed ears. Chris tried to remember. No, he said. More sort of knobbly, like stone muffins. Oh, she nodded. Just occurred to me, it might have been the same one, tracking you. They do that sometimes, she added blithely. Just seemed to fixate on a particular human, follow him around for a bit, before they strike. We've got no idea why they do that. Oh, he said. I wish you hadn't told me that. Jill laughed. I thought he'd made a joke. No, she went on. There must have been something that stopped it attacking you. Something that either drained its energy or put it off. Made you seem unappetizing, as it were. Something you had with you in the car, perhaps. Chris pursed his lips. Such as? Well, there's all sorts of things we believe they don't like. Same as vampires and garlic, only it's a bit subtler than that. Different things repel different demons. Uh, for example... Hang on, he interrupted. We sell stuff like that. LY42V, Evil Off Anti-Demon Talismans. Very good line. We do a lot of them, especially around the Walsall area. Jill giggled. <clears throat> Sorry, she said. But they're a bit of a standing joke in the department. Oh, Chris scowled. They don't work, then? Well, yes and no, she replied. Actually, they're a pretty effective defence against female grade six servitor demons. That's basically cooks, laundry and clerical staff, which, to be honest with you, aren't that much of a problem, since they almost never show up in the material world, unless they're really hungry and desperate. So, essentially, your talisman things are a bit like an umbrella, one inch square. Keeps off some of the rain... But not most of it. Though, she went on, I suppose if you had a lot of them, twenty or thirty. Carstock, he said excitedly. 
it's one of the lines where I carry a couple of dozen in the car, so if a customer needs a stock in a hurry, I can supply them on the spot. Oh! Jill looked interested. In which case? Except, he said suddenly, remembering, I sold the whole lot to Paul at the magic shack this morning, just before it happened, so it couldn't have been that, could it? Sigh. Not really, no. Oh, well, she said. If it wasn't that, it must have been something else. We'll check out everything you've got in the car. Don't look at me like that. It's not my fault. I'll see if I can arrange a car you can borrow till we've finished with yours. How'd that be? Thanks, Chris said, a trifle grudgingly. But all my samples. Sorry, Jill shook her head. Get them back to you as soon as possible. Meanwhile... I'd say you've got an ironclad excuse for taking the rest of the day off. Now that can't be bad, can it? She had a point there, to be sure. You couldn't possibly ring my boss, could you? Chris said, telling him it's a matter of national security and all that. Otherwise, he'll be on at me for skiving. No trouble, Jill replied with a grin. In fact, I could say we'll be needing you on call for the next 24 hours, so you can't possibly go back to work until after the weekend, all right? Chris nodded solemnly. I always knew you'd come in useful for something one of these days, he replied. The car she got for him was a big black BMW with cruise control, a radio like something from NASA and, Chris discovered joyfully as he scrabbled about in the boot, one of those magnetic sirens you can slap on the roof like in the cop shows. He couldn't quite bring himself to use it though and when he tried to turn on the radio an extremely snotty voice asked him for a security access cord and he said some really quite hurtful things when he said he hadn't got one. The cruise control had him zooming down the motorway at 110 mile an hour until he finally managed to turn the bloody thing off. The claws were an improvement too. Jill had coerced one of the Deerglow men into lending him some in return for his own, which had been sealed in plastic bags, tugged and packed in a massive steel lead-lined trunk. The replacements fitted better than his own and the polo shirt had a little goblin embroidered on the pocket over a crest and the letters D.S., Chris had an idea he'd seen it before somewhere. A bit later, he remembered that some of Jill's stuff had the same logo, so it was probably some kind of design or something. He speculated briefly about neglecting to give it back when his own cores were returned, but accepted fatalistically that he would not get away with it. The rest of the day was his own. Strange and unfamiliar concept. He couldn't remember offhand when he'd last had a day off of his very own. Days belonged to work, apart from holidays and weekends, which belonged to Karen, and were spent shopping for and assembling flat-pack chipboard furniture and visiting her loathsome relatives. The best part of half a day all to himself, to spend as he chose, with the added bonus of needle-sharp designer clothes and a big, fast black car filled with the government's petrol. It was almost as though God had given him a gift voucher for his birthday. Yes, Chris thought, as he drove. But what am I going to do with it? Go home? No way. I can go home any time. All right, then. I can drive somewhere, which is what I do all day for work. Or I can drive home, park the car and spend the afternoon in a pub. Cautionary tale, widely repeated by the JWW retail reps about a customer who bought a JWW sheer genius gin in a bottle. Three days later, he lurched back into the shop looking haggard and miserable, demanding his money back. Why? asked the girl behind the till. What's wrong with it? Bloody thing told me I could have three wishes, the customer replied, and I've spent the last three days trying to decide, and there's absolutely nothing I want, except, the customer added, my money back. He pulled in at a little chef ordered the Alabama Sunrise jacket, potato and chips and stared out the window for a while, watching the cars queuing for petrol. The terror had worn off, but there was still a residual ache, like a bruise, where it had been. Demons, he thought. There really are such things as demons. They're out there, wandering around, invisible, and they eat people. Not the most cheerful of thoughts. The Alabama sunrise arrived. 
medium-sized industrial potato with a bit of cheese melted in it and a few bits of leaf scattered around the edge, plus a small mountain of chips. Chris stabbed the fork against the potato's dense hide and felt the tines bend. Then a thought struck him, so dreadful that he nearly choked. Satnav! Stripped the car down to the subatomic level, the dear Glorger had said. Even if he'd been exaggerating somewhat, it was more or less inevitable that they'd stick a screwdriver into her casing and prise her open. And then what? Would she survive? How did this imprisoning thing work anyway? Could they take her out, peer about inside the casing for very small demons and put her back again, good as new? Somehow he doubted that. Not government thinking. Their attitude was likely to be more along the lines of smash it open with a hammer, zap anything inside, chuck the remains in the skip and if they want to try claiming compensation for damaged property, bloody good luck to them. No way, he said to himself. Got to save her before it's too late. With an effort, he elbowed a path through the panic in his mind and tried to think what to do. Jill, of course, she was the boss. She could stop them. And she would, he knew, provided he gave her a half-sensible reason. Excuse me, said the waitress, but do you know you're eating your tie? Which was perfectly true. <laughs> Sorry, Chris said, once he'd fished it out of his mouth. I was miles away, you see. The government's taken my satnav because of the demon, and they're going to kill her unless I stop them. Hearing it out loud, together with the stuffed expression on the waitress's face, had a sobering effect on him. A bit like jumping into a nice hot bath, only to find that someone forgot to turn on the immersion heater. <laughs> only joking, he said cheerfully. Can I have some more coffee, please? Probably, Chris told himself. The waitress was looking back at him over her shoulder, presumably in case she was called on to be a witness at some point in the future. It was just as well. In the back of his mind, he could hear Ben Jarrow's soft, bleating voice can sometimes be a bit of an unhealthy influence. You'd do well to be on the lookout for warning signs. Could it really be happening to him, he wondered. Not a comfortable thought, but now it seemed like the dear glow crowd had solved the problem for him. No more satnav, no more unhealthy influence. He'd miss her, of course, but if he really was falling under the spell of some kind of malign power, not that he could bring himself to believe it, but... Presumably that was how all the victims felt, in which case he owed Jill and her brightly coloured staff a vote of thanks, which would be worse, he speculated, being possessed by a dark spirit or eaten by a demon. Both, he decided. The more Chris thought about it, the dodgier his recent behaviour seemed to be. Now he came to think of it, he actually talked to the horrible machine. Worse still, it had talked back to him. Funny how he hadn't really remembered it before. It had been like a dream. A wispy, vague memory that seeps away as you wake up, and half an hour later you can't recall a single detail. That surely was suspicious in itself, implying that the critter in the plastic box was deliberately covering its tracks by doing things to his memory. The thought made him shudder so much that he spilt coffee on his knee. Now, though, it was as though the spell had shattered, and he could hear himself talking, chatting with the thing, asking its advice about how to handle the difficult shop managers, mourning to it about the trainee, even by the fairly relaxed standards of the retail sorcery trade. That was pretty odd behaviour. A man his age with an imaginary friend. More than that, an imaginary friend with a criminal record, currently doing life for some particularly nasty crime, and maybe... This one made him went so hard that he nearly knocked over the table. Maybe Satnav had something to do with the fact that he couldn't seem to go more than five miles these days without tripping over demons. After all, if she was a criminal, murder, necromancy, there was at least a possibility that she was plotting her escape with the demons. While you're ripping him limb from limb, if you could possibly see your way to cracking open my plastic box... I could just slip away in the confusion, and everybody will assume I got broken by accident, and they won't come after me. No, 
Even now that the spell was broken, Chris couldn't make himself credit that, except, of course, that the last thing the demon did before kicking open the door and bolting had been to lean across him and do something with Satnav's controls. At the time, he'd been sure it had switched her off. But maybe he'd got that wrong. He cursed himself for being too chicken to tell Jill about that. It was going to be embarrassing when he spoke to her next and filled in the missing details, which he now knew he had a duty to do since it could possibly explain everything and, even more important, there was something that Satnav herself had said. He was convinced of it, though he couldn't actually bring to mind what the exact words had been. He gobbled down the rest of his chips, paid the bill and hurried back to the car. Quick check to make sure there weren't any demons hiding under the road atlas on the back seat, and he set off for home. But with a detour. He stopped off at Enchanted Worlds in Nuneaton, where he was fairly sure they quite liked him, and asked to see a copy of the Book of All Human Knowledge. It's a random quality control check, he said, and he could see they were impressed. We've been getting reports of defective stock, so naturally. We haven't had any problems, the girl said. Well, apart from the thickies who don't read the instructions, but that's the public for you. We just tell them to... Chris gave her a big, buttery smile and waffled for a minute or so about proactive customer support being the backbone of inclusive retailing, and she brought him a copy of the book. He thanked her and asked if he could take it through into the staff room for a few minutes. No problem, she said. She even made him a coffee. The book, as so many customers had pointed out, had no index, no need for one, since the book knew better than you did what you really needed to know. But for professional grade users, there was a hidden way in. You folded back the corner of the copyright page and a menu dropped down. Press show hidden with your thumbnail and you get a list of options, including index. Chris scrolled down to demons, selected that, scrolled down further to killing and prodded the word with the pad of his index finger. The page went blank, apart from the universally loathed little black hourglass, then filled with print. Because they are multi-located in several different dimensions simultaneously, demons are notoriously difficult to kill. Furthermore, their highly advanced and adaptive metabolisms allow them to recover almost instantaneously from exceptionally severe wounds, and their skins are impregnated with armour charms. Magic of some sort is almost always necessary, but nearly all the known spells, charms, curses and incantations are species-specific, making positive identification, see Appendix 12, an essential preliminary exercise. Unfortunately, the speed and ferocity of demon attacks generally leaves little time for considered identification, and demon killing is generally regarded as an exercise best left to highly trained professionals who can recognise instantly which species and grade they are confronting and select their combat strategy accordingly. The only one-size-fits-all approach recognised by most competent authorities is physical cutting with either a living sword, of which only seven are known to exist, or a pantocopt. In the unlikely event that such an article is available at the time, Chris frowned and touched pantocopt with its finger. The page cleared, the revolting little hourglass twirled, and then a small box appeared, asking him for his username and password. But that was all right. He knew the universal key. He cleared his throat. 7971, A square standard, he said. The box vanished and was replaced by... Sorry, your attempt to access restricted information was unsuccessful. This may be because... A. You mumbled. B. You have a cold. C. You have strong regional accent or other speech impediment. D. You have recently undergone dental treatment and your mouth is still anaesthetised. Please rectify the problem and try again. Chris said something vulgar and indicative of a limited vocabulary. It was an open secret that several of the other reps had spent their own money on the Kawagachia NZ3000 open book, which didn't have all this interactive shit, but did have an index. Cleared his throat again, sat up straight and did his best Alec Guinness impersonation, and this time got... 
The Panticopt is a magical weapon of exceptional power, capable of cutting through practically anything. Furthermore, anything severed by one cannot be repaired, rejoined or revived, even by the most extreme magic. Resembling a long, thin sheet of metal foil, it operates by disrupting the severed object in all known dimensions and time frames, making it impossible for the severed object to be taken back through time while simultaneously cauterizing the cut edges with transfiguration spells that transform them into mutually repellent elements, such as fire and water. Possession of pantacops is illegal in most jurisdictions. In consequence, they are often magically disguised as everyday mundane objects, such as... He closed the book with a snap. Oh, he thought. Back at the office, Chris had a desk. On his first day in the job... He'd gone through the drawers, the way you do, and one of the bits of stray useless junk he'd found in there was a tear measure, something he hadn't got but would be needing, since Karen wanted new carpet in the bathroom. So he'd slipped it in his pocket and promptly forgotten all about it, until the next day, when Julie from reception came crashing in, asking if he'd seen a tear measure anywhere. Rather than confess that he'd stolen it, which would have been embarrassing, he'd said no, but Julie had insisted on turning the whole room upside down looking for it, and when the search proved futile, she gave him ever such a funny look and went off in a foul mood. Later, when carpet day arrived, Karen had already gone out and bought a tape measure, and the stolen one had ended up in the kitchen drawer where hammers, screwdrivers and other DIY-related hardware went to hide and he had no reason to believe it wasn't still there. Unlikely, of course. Probably it was just the office tape measure, and Julie had been all pissy about not finding it, because Julie was all pissy about everything. Even so. Was he all right? The girl asked him as he emerged from the staff room. Chris shook his head. I'll give you a returns note, he said, stowing the book in his jacket pocket. Mind you sent it in with the next invoice, and... Any other problems while I'm here? He drove straight home and hurried into the kitchen. It was there, buried under a dense seam of roll plugs, little metal things and bits of wooden dowel left over from various flat pack assembly sessions. He picked it up nervously. Exceptional power, capable of cutting through practically anything. And put it down gently on the worktop. Just a tape measure. Yellow with the name of a big DIY chain printed on it. Except, he noticed for the first time, the name was spelt wrong. Chris knew about that. The fundamental law of physical metamorphosis by which any object magically transformed into something else will always have one slight flaw or mistake in it. A piano with one too many keys. A nine-legged spider or anything produced by Microsoft. So, whatever the hell it was, it hadn't been a tape measure originally. Which proved nothing. Could just as easily be that someone in the office, needing to measure something and being too idle to go around the building looking for the tape measure, had magic to box file or a stapler. That was far more likely. He stared at it. A magical weapon of exceptional power. Sounded really cool on the page, but maybe not so cool if you had one lying on the table in front of you. Lethal. Illegal. And almost certainly very dangerous to use. On the other hand, if he really was being followed about by demons, it'd be reassuring to think that he had some sort of an edge. Oh, no pun intended. He looked around for something expendable and assembled a carrot... A pencil, and for the hell of it, a heavy glass floral paperweight that Karen had been given as a leaving present by her enemies at her previous job, and which had so far resisted all efforts to smash or chip it. The carrot and the pencil he set up trestle fashion, their ends perched on the rims of coffee mugs. Couldn't do that with the paperweight, so he rested it on the tiled floor. Here goes, Chris said aloud, nestled his thumb against a small chrome tab that stuck out of the body of the tape measure, and pulled. It looked just like a tape measure. Yellow steel strip with numbers printed on it. This is silly, he thought. I bet it's exactly what it looks like. A thing for measuring things with. In which case, argued his malicious inner voice, you can whack the carrot with it and nothing will happen. And then you can get a grip on yourself, forget all this dark magic stuff and... He didn't think he'd actually touch the carrot with the edge of the steel tape. Just brought it very close. But the carrot halved. 
and the two pieces fell on the worktop with a gentle thud. He froze, too scared to move. Oh shit, he thought. It's real. It works. Now what the hell do I do? For one thing, how'd you get the tape back inside the plastic gears without streaming off all your fingers? <laughs> Chris tried the pencil, which subdivided instantly. He was holding the tape measure at arm's length now. His head craned back and away, and he thought, what kind of dangerously irresponsible lunatic would disguise something like this as a tape measure and then leave it lying about in a desk? And then he remembered the way that Demon had grinned at him and the feel of its arm brushing against him as it leaned forward. He relaxed just enough to move and addressed the paperweight, squaring up to it the way he'd seen the samurai do in films. And very carefully, he nudged the glass with the edge. Fuck, he thought, and then Karen's going to kill me when she sees this. The tape measure hadn't just gone through the paperweight, the halves of which had rolled away across the floor, but the tile as well, which had cracked in two. Thanks to the handy numbers printed on the side, he knew precisely how deep it had gone. <laughs> Nine inches. And he'd barely touched it. He drew it slowly out of the crack in the tile. There was the usual button on the side of the casing. Press it forward and the tape would snap back into the handle. He didn't fancy trying that for some reason, but <laughs> maybe it was because he was nervous, which made him grip too hard and press the button accidentally. It did it anyway. There was a cracking noise. He felt the recoil as the chrome stopped slammed against the plastic gears. And, well, there it was, lying in the palm of his hand. A simple, inoffensive tip measure. He could almost have convinced himself that none of it had happened. If it hadn't been for the carrot, the pencil, the paperweight, and the bloody great big crack in the kitchen tile, which Karen would notice the moment she set foot through the front door, and she was going to be so mad at him. Glue. Chris thought desperately, or Polyfella and some of her makeup stuff to make it the same colour as the tile. It was a good idea by his standards, and it should have worked, except that nothing he tried would make the Polyfella stay in the crack. He even tried looking up mending enchanted cracks in the book, but all he got was an error message, and please try again later, and when he tried again, what he got was... Operates by disrupting the severed object in all known dimensions and time frames while simultaneously cauterizing the cut edges with transfiguration spells that transform them into mutually repellent elements. Told you so. Oh my god. Now, I I'm sure I'm not the only person that's had an accident with one of these tape measures. <laughs> and I would say that Mr. Holt has probably had an accident with them too. So, isn't there a general rule of thumb, right? Where every father, every dad, every man indeed, pulls out the tape measure to as far as it'll go and then snap it back. <laughs> Is it not a rite of passage for, in fact, every male human being out there? And in fact, I believe every human being out there because, yeah... But the thing is, just, just make sure your finger moves. I think that's why the little rollback thing's on the front. You know, not to have your finger on the side. Yes, there, 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 is, a, there is a warning in this. <laughs> Make me chuckle. I was like reading this, I was like trying to stay all, all serious and grown up and everything. I was like... <laughs> anyway, lovely beans. <laughs> Thank you so much being here if you've come through to this end. And I know a lot of you do. And I'm so grateful for that. I, I love your faces. Um, so yes, hopefully we'll get another chapter in a couple of days and you can see why this is one of my favourites because it's just so daft. Um, <laughs> can't get over that tape measure. Oh, one of these days I'll be able to read that part with a straight face. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry for just laughing away, but yes, please do the old, um, the, the dibby dabby likey thing and, and sharing and subscribing if you'd like to and notifications bell and, and bing bong and all that sort of stuff but most of all most importantly get good rest keep yourself safe and i'll catch you in a couple of days pal take it easy <laughs> i am being sincere i promise i just got a case of the giggles <laughs> see you in a couple of days <laughs>